If you love ancient history, then this is the channel for you. History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but dedicated just to ad-free history documentaries, including a huge library of ancient history content from the 9th Legion to Boudicca to the First Britain. Simply check out the details in the description below and make sure you use code ODYSSEY on sign up. Over there's Lou Island off the dramatic coast of Cornwall. And to say it's got a romantic history is an understatement. You can't move for stories of shipwrecks and pirates and monks and ghosts and treasure maps. Pilgrims frequently lost their lives in these waters on the trip to a chapel on the island which has now vanished. And legend has it that Jesus Christ himself played on this very beach when he was a little boy. It would have been a great draw for early believers, but true or not, could this island have witnessed the very first rumblings of Christianity in Britain? a somewhat challenging time team because the tides only give us five working hours a day on the island and marshalling the team is no easy task. Look at this, he's just half the boat. Look, <laughs> what's he doing? Ancient flint. I oh, know. <laughs> so you reckon we're going to find oh, the first yeah, right, right, there, This is an omen. Right, OK. Yeah, you're in there. Yeah. I was looking at the quartz pebbles. Now, nah, never mind the quartz pebbles. That's what you get on early Christian sites. Ah, but on really good sites you get flint. Come on. Here in Lou, we're investigating a story of two chapels. In the medieval period, they belonged to Glastonbury Abbey, the important Somerset monastery famous for cultivating the legends of King Arthur and Joseph of Arimathea. And according to local legend, it was Joseph of Arimathea who brought Jesus Christ to Lou Island and left him to play in the safety of these beaches while he went off to do business with Cornish tin merchants. If people really did believe that Jesus played here when he was a lad, that would have got people flocking here, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, that would have driven a whole pilgrimage industry of people coming out here to see, you know, and the support structure for it. It's just that sort of thing that people travel around to, to visit. So you're really champing the bit now, aren't you? Well, of course I am. I mean, the point is that, that time and tide are the two things that wait for no man. We have got to get off of this island by early afternoon. And we've only got half our diggers because the others are, I don't know if you can see, just round the headland there, up on that hillside. What are they doing there, Mick? There's another chapel over there, halfway up the hill, and they're, and they're said to be the same size. One's said to be a copy of the other one. But the mainland chapel has been excavated already, hasn't it, Phil? Well, that's right. I mean, partially dug, at least. I mean, in the 1930s, some local Cornish archaeologists went in there. They were slightly eccentric ideas. They were desperate that it should be pre-Norman, and they kind of labelled it Celtic. Yeah. What do we mean by Celtic, Mick? It's a shorthand term in the West Country for something that's after the Romans, but before the Normans. But of course, we don't have Anglo-Saxons in this area, so it, it's, it's a short-hand term for that Dark Age period. And it is a period that you are specifically interested Absolutely. in. Yes. <laughs> Lights up his little face. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, on that chapel over there, there were deposits there that, that were not actually dug, so we could actually get some dating yeah. evidence there. As far as we know, this chapel site here has never been dug, yeah. and we should get some date in here. If we could date either or both of them, that would be incredibly important. Before we can date our chapel on the island, we need to find it. And there are some pretty good indications where it stood. Bit of a clue here, isn't it? And there are other clues. Looks like this is the east wall here. Right. North wall going, going up there. And then it's Stuart thinks he can see its footprint in the earthworks. And there are maps dating back to the 16th century showing a chapel right on top of the hill. Right, that should be our excavated area in between these strings, so if you want to start stripping the turf off of that, that'll be fine. Thank you, Newt. So, with time in short supply, Phil's confident enough to get going without GFIS results. I don't know, there might be a wall here. Watch this. Hard. Yeah. Hard. Yep. Hard. Hard. Yeah. Soft again. Yeah, see if you've got something about there, <laughs> doesn't it? 
presumably these stones sticking through the soil here are a bit of a clue, aren't they? You're an observant sort of chap, <laughs> isn't you? The chapel we're looking for on the island was dedicated to St Michael, as was the one on the mainland. In fact, medieval pilgrims are known to have flocked to sites dedicated to St Michael all the way down the Cornish coast. St Michael seems pretty popular. Who was he? Well, he's uh, an angel. He is the commander-in-chief of God's armies. And so you have to imagine him and them up in the skies, keeping us all safe from the devil and his gorillas. And he's also very important to us personally when we die. He is the security guard who frisks our souls as we go through from check-in to the departure lounge and make sure that we're suitable to go on the heavenly flight. Why is he important here in Loo? Well, it, it's a, a hilly island. It's the sort of place you'd want to have a chapel of St Michael. So I think that the monks of Glastonbury were trying to develop this as a rival place to St Michael's Mount. St Michael's Mount was doing very well with pilgrims and they were bringing in a lot of offerings to the monks who ran that island. And Glastonbury was great into what you might call religious staging. I, I sometimes think of Glastonbury as the first English theme park. They, they would know how to get a cult of St Michael off the ground down here. Documents suggest that the first thing Glastonbury did when they acquired the site was to build a brand new chapel on the mainland so that pilgrims could celebrate St Michael's Day without losing their lives on the crossing to the island. But here's the puzzle. Because when the site was excavated in the 1930s by Croft Andrew, he thought that Glastonbury just added a chancel to an already existing chapel. But the Second World War cut short his excavations, so we're going to pick up where he left off. Back on the island, we've already found some possible chapel walls. Just sketching roughly where that... Yeah, well, shaped trench is going. So and Stuart's nose there. for earthworks has sniffed out what he thinks is a nave for the pilgrims and a chancel for the altar. You see, Phil's getting a bit of a wall coming out through there, which rather suggests that that's probably the first block mm -hmm. with perhaps that added on to it. Right. Mick's theory about the island chapel is a bit like Croft Andrew's theory that the monks at Glastonbury added a chancel to a pre-existing nave in the mainland chapel. And Andrew thought the original mainland nave was Celtic. So Oliver Crichton's been looking for clues as to why he did. Just looking closely at this plan here from the Croft Andrews excavations in the 30s. Yes. Look at these two post holes. I'm sure those are worth looking at. And they're right next to what are marked on the plan as a set of steps running up here, up yeah. the slope. So what do we put a little trench to take in those post holes and let's see if there's another one. And if you're really lucky, it'll be an early feature. That would be a very nice thing to find. It's safe to say we can expect some rather complicated archaeology relating to different phases of chapels on both our sites. So what do you think the timeline might be? The very early, what they call Celtic chapel, would be wood and we just yeah. find post holes. Yeah. Then what? If we're lucky, we find post holes. And then we get a stone building on top of that, which is pretty small and pretty featureless. And then somebody comes along and revamps that with some nice architectural pieces, perhaps doorways, chancel arch, windows, in the 12th century. That would be my guess as to what we'd see on the site. The structures themselves could be the best clue we have when it comes to dating, because chapels don't have the domestic rubbish that we usually rely on to date buildings. Hey, Phil, that trench is coming along, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it looks like we've got the beginnings of a wall, Tony. I mean, we always knew that there were those big stones just immediately underneath the turf, but now we've got it stripped off. You can see there's a nice edge there, but we really need to be able to get down to confirm that that is a wall. We certainly can't date it, but we can begin to suggest that it is a chapel. Jackie was showing me some bone earlier on. What you got, Jackie? The bits that are really of interest are these pieces here. Now, these are bits of human femur, and it's quite a, a large individual. You can see these ridges running down here. This is where the big thigh muscles attach, and they really are quite rugged. So this is quite a large individual with quite chunky thighs. So we've got the mystery of a big-thighed person <laughs> somewhere on this island <laughs> at some time. 
And he might not be the only burial here, because human bones are said to have been revealed as the cliff faces have eroded. Glastonbury acquired this land sometime in the 12th century, and legal documents suggest that there was already a chapel on the island at this time. They also tell us who Glastonbury sent to set up their new pilgrim site. We find that one of the witnesses of the charter was Elias, then prior of the same place, and his fellow monk, John. And this is wonderful because we there have the staff of the little priory of Glastonbury Abbey at La Manor. Uh, just two monks, because you have to have two monks as a quorum to form a monastery. I have a feeling that Prior Elias and Brother John would have found themselves with quite a challenge on their hands, setting up a money-making pilgrim industry on this somewhat inhospitable island. Even today, if the wind swings to the east, the island can find itself cut off from the mainland for days on end. So, with storms forecast, some of our team have volunteered to rough it here after the rest of us have left for the day so that work can continue, whatever the weather. This is where the archaeologists who are staying on the island are going to sleep. Lovely bunk beds made out of driftwood from a Maltese ship that foundered off the island somewhere. It's lovely here, isn't it? The toilet facilities you don't want to know about. What a shame that I'm going to have to stay in a warm hotel on the mainland. But there is something really magical about this place, which was recently left to the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, who are doing their best to restore it to its former glory. Or at least John is, because you're the warden here, aren't um, you? Yes, yes. Do you stay here all year round? Mainly in the summer, but I've been here a few winters, yes. It becomes harsh. Where you live now, do you reckon that's the best place to live on the island? Without doubt. It's sheltered from the prevailing winds. You can have a southwesterly gale and it's, you don't feel it. There's deep soil here for growing crops, yes. It would be lovely to think that our archaeologists are going to be staying where the monks once lived. At the chapel on the top of the island, it looks like we've found a potential north wall. And Ian's put in a new trench, looking for the west end. But the tides are going out, and we've got to leave. It's a really frustrating moment. It's 2.20. Normally, we'd be only halfway through day one, but we've got to get the boat back in 10 minutes and just leaving Tracy and Matt and a few of the others to keep digging. Phil, Jackie, we've got to go now, I'm afraid. Already? Already, come on. Ooh. Right, come on. Cheers, Matt. While we're gone, our island team will be trying to discover more about the chapel that enticed pilgrims across these treacherous waters. Do you think pilgrims really did drown on the way out here, or do you reckon it was just a folk tale? I think there's a good chance it really happened. There was a court case in 1290 where they got a jury of 12 local men, and they said that in days of old, when people wanted to visit the island on St Michael's Day, uh, they were at risk of losing their lives in the stormy sea. When was St Michael's Day? Well, there were three of them. There was, there was one on the 5th of May, then there's the famous one we all know about, 29th of September, and then there's one even later in the year, in October. Three of them? They could have been carnage, couldn't they? <laughs> yeah. Tim, you're the local ferryman. You know this place more than anybody else. Do you think people actually could have drowned on that little journey just out from the mainland to here? Well, I think it's quite possible, yeah. We're going to be all right today? I hope so. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> On the other side of the water, we found steps coming down the hillside into the chapel on the mainland, chunky stone walls, and a floor surface carved out of the rock face. It seems to be deliberately terraced into the hillside at exactly the same height as the island chapel. Isn't it weird looking back at our chapel from this chapel? It is, and yet this is strangely familiar. I mean, when you look at the size of this chapel and you think about the earthworks over there, they are very, very similar. On both sides, we're trying to find out whether the chancels were put in as part of the Glastonbury revamp. So where are you? Well, our trench is actually running all the way across here. So have you found the skeleton? Unfortunately, we haven't found any skeletons and we haven't even found it at the grave cuts either. What about this wall? 
Well, yes and no. Can you see this, what looks like a wall running here? You, the, there's almost like face stones coming through. Well, they're actually floating on top of this dirt. We need to get to grips with this wall to find out whether there was a nave here before Glastonbury added a chancel. And Bridge and Oliver have now found some post holes that might prove Croft Andrew's theory that this nave was Celtic. But it would have been a hell of a job cutting through that rock, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I haven't excavated them yet, but having stuck my trowel down, they're at least the steep. So do we think we've got our earlier chapel, our early timber chapel? If you're very, very lucky. On the other hand, oh. of course, they could be late. They could be post-dissolution, yeah. for all we know. Yeah. But we've also got this other new feature that just come up, which may support an earlier structure. Um, can you see down here, we've yeah. got this wee gully <laughs> yes. and it's been actually cut into the stone, it's at a right angle and that could well be a timber slot for an earlier building. And that's in line with those post holes as well, isn't it? Absolutely. It's funny, you know, it's all rocking here with things cut into it. On the other side of the trench, it's all soil and build up. The chapel of two halves. <laughs> By the end of day one, we've established that whoever built the mainland chapel went to a lot of trouble to put it halfway up a hillside instead of on the top. And it seems to be pointed very deliberately at the island. But was it built as a mirror image of the island chapel? We'll find out tomorrow. Day two in Lou in Cornwall, where we're trying to work out what was here before Glastonbury Abbey attempted to create two major pilgrimage sites, one on the island and one on the mainland. Yesterday on the mainland, we thought we might have found evidence of a wooden chapel in the form of a beam slot and two impressive post holes hacked into the rock. There are kind of pickaxe marks. You can see very clearly there and there and there. The alternative is that they're part of the later stone chapel. It's a whacking great thing. It is, yeah. I was just trying to think, what is there that sits in the west corner of a church? Um, the Western gallery is something that was suggested, but I only know of post-medieval They're post-medieval in date, yeah. What we desperately need is some dating evidence. It's just really maddening that we haven't got any signs. Well, keep doing. Nowadays, Lou harbours the starting point for a trip to the island, but it seems too far away from the mainland complex to have been used by medieval monks and pilgrims. And now Stuart has identified a more direct route between the mainland and the island. Even today, twice a year, people and families still can physically walk across that gap at very low tide. Uh, it's sort of a pilgrimage, but there is the ingredients here for a medieval harbour. A harbour? Literally here. Now, if you look out over there, you can see how jagged those rocks are. They would really sort of rip the bottom off any boat that tried to land, even at high mm. tide. And it's the same over here. But in this gap in between, in this bay, you've got these nice, smooth rocks in this here. This where this big sandy patch is. That's right. So you, you, could, you literally could bring a boat in here at that high tide. If this is the place where monks and pilgrims embarked, you might expect to find lodgings nearby and only a short distance away is a wall which Croft Andrew called the Monk's House when he excavated the site in the 30s. So based on the geophys, we're putting a new trench in to find out if this was where our two monks lived or even a place where pilgrims could have sought accommodation. If you, if you look at that wall there, yes. that's the kind of thing that we're looking for and it's not pretty dissimilar to what we're finding down here, is it? On our way to the island, the wind turns on us. And we're getting a taste of just how difficult this crossing could have been. It's 10 past 10, at last the tide's high enough for us to get back out to the island again, but hopefully Matt and the rest of the team have been digging for the last few hours. Tony to Matt, can you hear me? Tony to Matt. Tony? What have you been doing since we left? Well, we obviously put in a couple of hours' work. No, we, we, we got down to the beach, we found a kayak, we went out kayaking and I had, a, I had a dip in the sea as well, it was absolutely beautiful. I'm so pleased for you, mate. See you in a bit. See ya. Despite appearances, our island team has made a lot of progress since we left. Traces exposed more of the north wall of the chapel and Matt's been trying to find the east wall. We've got through the rubble. Oh, wow! Yeah. Oh, God, that looks like floor. 
doesn't it? In the West End, Ian's cleared a lot of rubble and found something a bit odd. What on earth is that? Well, it's a big lump of iron. Look, God knows how old it is. And all that before hitting the beach. Proper freezing. <laughs> Tough life. Our boats made it safely today, but the story goes the Pilgrim's boats were wrecked on a regular basis on the perilous rocks around the island. And even today, these rocks can cause problems. If there are going to be wrecks here, we've got the perfect team to help us find them. We've got Mark and Johnny here from the Royal Navy. How are you going to approach this task, Mark? Well, first of all, we'll go for a dive out in the bay behind us, and then the two guys that live down in the boat will uh, do the second dive. But one of them's got a bit of a hangover, so he wants to go second rather well, he than first. He will go second, yes. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, equipped with our underwater camera, the Navy dive team sets off to look for medieval wrecks. Pilgrims who made it safely to the island chapel believed that St Michael would reward their bravery with time off purgatory and were just beginning to uncover the nave where they would have stood. Phil, I think I might have a piece of in situ flooring here. Good Lord. Yeah. And, and it, that is exactly the same sort of surface that we had on the mainland chapel yesterday, wasn't yeah. it? That was, was, was a mortared surface, just like this, and it's patches directly on the natural bedrock. And right. this wall, too. I like this wall here. So what, what angle are we on there? Where's, where's well, north? Uh, hang on. Here we go. I'll tell exactly what angle we are. Hang on, east-west. It doesn't get much better than that, does it? It doesn't get much better than that. This wall's convincing because chapels generally face the east, often orientated to the sunrise of their saints' day. Now we can really get our teeth into working out what it might have looked like. 1590s, all these lovely ships. Yes, that's there. amazing. Um, because this is, is showing the disposition of the English and, and Spanish fleets at the Armada. Oh, it, it's a yeah. story map to some extent. Yeah. But you can see along here, we've got what's called St Michael's Island at that stage. But it still shows a chapel. It depicts it with a tower. But I, I think you have to take that kind of with a pinch of salt. Now we've got a... A map of 1539. This is, is the earliest depiction of the chapel on the island. There's quite a lot of detail, isn't there? You can see a, what looks like a large window there, and then something like a weathercock or, or a bell at mm. this end. What's worrying me is that in 1539, we know that our chapel on the mainland was still standing and being used, but it's not there. That's one of the problems with maps used for navigation. And if that chapel wasn't especially visible, from the routes they were using along the coastline. But they didn't bother to map it. This image of the island chapel suggests that it could have been a single cell building, a much simpler design than we were expecting. We've got the wall now, it is bang on east west. Right. Now the interesting thing now is what is happening in here. Because we've got all this, these stones are mortared in. So this is actually masonry. Right. Now, what I don't know, and I'm trying to resolve, is whether or not that wall comes along and turns. In other words, we're actually in the northeast corner of the chapel, yeah. or whether it's actually a big sort of swelling to take a, a buttress or a big column that might support a chancel arch. Like the big stones we've got over here, in fact. Exactly. Yeah. And now you see, down there, Matt had another wall. Yeah. Now, we did wonder at one stage whether or not that might be the south wall of the chapel. But now we've actually cleaned it up and looked at it, you actually see that it's on a slightly different alignment, it's southwest to northeast. Right. So I'm rather hopeful, if it worked out all right for me, we'd have a wall coming here, be the northeast corner of the chapel. Yeah. This is the chapel, that would be a separate building outside it. If Phil's right, the island chapel could be much smaller than the mainland chapel. So the theory that they were mirror images is looking a bit shaky. But it's early days. Ian hasn't found the west end of the chapel yet, although he has found plenty of other things. Well, I'm plunging down into this deep, dark hole, and it seems to be full of Victorian rubbish. But at this end, we've got this huge wall, this revetment down on this side. That doesn't look Victorian to me. I mean, that looks like a prehistoric burial chamber or barrow or something like that. The whole thing does look a bit like a sort of big barrow on the top here, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, that wasn't in the script. But if it is prehistoric, people could have been living and dying on the island for thousands of years. 
And there is evidence that somebody was trading here before our medieval monks arrived. These are actually anchor stones. They're used for anchoring boats. Stones like these have been used certainly since the Iron Age, right through to the post-Roman period. Not for the big ships, but for the little ones, like the lighters and that that are used to bring stuff ashore. Do you really think that these anchors imply that there was trade going on here a couple of thousand years ago? Well, we know that there was a Roman amphora found between the island and the site on the mainland we're digging, and we know that there was a post-Roman 5th and 6th century piece of amphora found on the island itself. So those are foreign pieces of pottery which has had to have been brought by ship onto the island here. If Mediterranean people were trading here in the post-Roman period, this could be the basis for the Joseph of Arimathea story. And this post-Roman period was the time when Christianity was really taking hold in Cornwall, vividly dramatised by the legends of the Cornish saints. They tended to imagine them coming to Cornwall from elsewhere, usually Wales or Ireland, uh -huh. sometimes miraculously, and St Ia, who is the patron saint of St Ives, came over on a leaf, oh, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, they also thought that they had helped create the landscape, that they'd, they'd opened holy wells and they'd killed local giants. So they're very local mm. to the landscape. And who were they, these saints? We don't know really who they were because they lived before the age that documentation starts. But the likelihood is that they were people who founded churches or were clergy of churches or people who were buried at churches. So if there was a saint associated with the site, he'd be likely to be buried within one of our chapels. And on the mainland, Bridge has found something suspiciously burial-like in front of the altar. We've got these pitch stones here. There's a hollow, isn't coming. there, just there? That's exactly it. To me, that looks very much like a burial. It's east-west, right in the middle of the building. The chancel arch would have been above us. So it could potentially be a really, really good find. Great stuff. A burial in this position is likely to be somebody important to the chapel, one of our monks or even a Cornish saint. Meanwhile, we've put a new trench in on the island to see if there's any evidence that this is where the monks lived. But that's not quite the whole story. For the very first time on Time Team, we've got a treasure map, and this... <laughs> you're rather embarrassed by this, aren't you? <laughs> this is the trench that we've put in in order to find the treasure. John, explain. Well, there was actually a, a, an American Time Team fan that called us to come and do a survey here. Somehow he got hold of this map with this cross, and this is supposed to be the site of some treasure. And actually, Jimmy got fantastic results with the radar, and this is what we found. What do you I mean, think it might be? Is it natural? Well, I don't think it's natural. You've got the two edges, you've got the end there. It's about as thick as that spade. And I mean, it could be the top of a, uh, a kiss burial or, or something medieval or, or even a standing stone, which has fallen over or been buried. I mean, that's the other possibility. That's what we thought. Is that a sack of doubloons you've got down there, Ken? Oh, don't. Stop <laughs> it. Stop it. <laughs> The tides have suddenly gone out, and we're going to have to leave early. But just before we go, Ian's got the earliest piece of pottery we've had in either chapel. It's quite crude and handmade. So what sort of date is this thing? Probably the late 1100s into the early 1200s. Oh, crikey, so that's considerably early, isn't it? This is when Glastonbury was trying to get their cult of St Michael going. But admiring it nearly gets us stranded. Thankfully, it's not long before we're on our way to the mainland. But it's not so hard to imagine monks and pilgrims falling foul of the jagged rocks, where our team of divers from the Navy have been filming their search for wrecks. How'd you get on? Uh, lots of wildlife, um, some seals, fish, crabs, but unfortunately no wreckage. You swam with the seals? We did swim with seals, um, it was beautiful. Ever done that before? Never, first time, so it's uh, all worthwhile. But no wreckage? Nothing at all. Why do you think that is? Do you think that little passage of water actually is much less dangerous than people have said and there haven't been the wrecks down there that we thought? No, not at all. Um, there's a lot of rocks down there and it does get very shallow at low tide, so I'm, I'm sure there have been uh, wreckage there before. But um, just the amount of wildlife and uh, seaweed that's grown, you, we wouldn't see anything. But at least just one with a seal. Yeah, that's well worthwhile, yeah, definitely. That could be. 
Up at the mainland chapel, Jack is casting an expert eye on what looks like a very important kissed burial. I just feel a bit different, actually, to the other side of that. So let's clean that up and see what he looks like. Kists are stone-lined graves used from prehistoric times right through to the medieval period, so they're difficult to date unless there are bones inside. Have you found the end of this burial yet? <laughs> well, no, we haven't really yet. We've extended the trench in the hope that we would, but it's just sort of eluding us at the moment. Jackie, we're blithely going on about this burial, but we haven't seen any bones. Is it definitely a burial? Um, it looks quite convincing at this end. You can see we've got uprights on this side and this side, and then there's one at the end here. Now, that's very narrow, so that would make that the foot end. I mean, there's, there's quite, these look like quite large capping stones. They look fairly convincing, but it's just finding the other end of it. If it is a burial, a radiocarbon date on a bone sample could help us work out if he was one of Glastonbury's monks or possibly even a Cornish saint. So day three is looking very exciting. Beginning of day three here at Loo in Cornwall. We've got a chapel on the island over there. We've got another one at the top of the hill. And this morning we're going to open the stone-lined burial we found yesterday. One day left, and frustratingly, the tides won't let us out to the island for a couple of hours yet. Jack is already hard at work on the possible grave in the mainland chapel because whoever lies inside it should be an important figure in our story. It's all a little bit strange. Strange in what way? It's very narrow, but mm. I think actually it's, it's narrow, it looks narrow because of the pressure of material pushing down on here. You can see the stone here is angled. I suspect it was originally further over there. But I think we might find that there's something underneath these. I'm probably going to have to take those out. Where do you think the end might be then, Jackie? Well, you can see how the soil changes completely there. So I think it actually could be right over here. It's a bit small, though, isn't it? It is. I mean, that's the one thing that I'm a little concerned about, is how short it appears to be. I think we need a bit more off down here. What else might it be, then? Given its position within the church, it could be a storage area for reliquies. Although one what might... are reliquies? It's usually some kind of box or co other kind of container in which you would store things like the bones of saints in your church for people, especially for the pilgrims to come to. Um, but it, I might expect that to be slightly more rectangular and shorter than this one is. This is why I think it's most likely to be a grave. But we can never be 100% sure until we get to the bottom and see if we can find some bones. Further down the hill, Rakshar has found the missing wall of the monk's house that we were looking for yesterday and it's a pretty substantial building. We've got lovely coursing down this side, right. and we've got another one here. You can actually see this line going across here, so that's the inside of the building. The standing remains show a two-storey building. Croft Andrew found two small bedrooms for our monks, and we found the back wall of a refectory, which would have been used by pilgrims waiting to get to the island on feast days when they really did make a day of it. What would they have done with their day? Well, the religious element would have centred on a mass set at about 9 or 10 in the morning, either on the island chapel, if you could get to it, or else at the mainland chapel. And then after mass was over, around about 11 o'clock, the rest of the day would be free for a jollification. So you have to imagine it as being something like a little fair here yes. with all the loo tradesmen selling food, souvenirs, games and that kind of thing. So it wasn't just a serious occasion and in fact people criticised pilgrimages for the things that people got up to that they didn't alter, like young men and young women going off together and the young women getting pregnant as a result and uh, having an illegitimate baby was known as going on pilgrimage or going to Jerusalem. Golly, that really does put a different face on it, doesn't it? It does indeed. Pilgrimages were not what you think they were. <laughs> Aside from getting up to no good, if they couldn't get to the island, pilgrims would have attended services at the mainland chapel and maybe laid offerings at the altar, where Jack is beginning to have doubts about the kissed burial. So it looks a bit more like a box now than a coffin, doesn't it? Yes, it seems to stop about there. It's about a metre long. Mm. But I'm going to see if we've got anything surviving under these slipped side stones there. If it was a box but there's nothing in it, does that make any sense? Well, 
it would fit in with the idea of it being a, a storage area for a reliquary, or, or perhaps even loose bones that were held in a cloth bag that have been subsequently removed. The Whose bones do you think they would have been? Saints' bones were carted around the countryside from you know, one, one end of the country to the other. Or it could have been one of the well-respected monks or abbots of the monastery. So, I mean, it could have been at the dissolution, for instance, these, these bones were removed and taken somewhere else, perhaps in secret. When Henry VIII closed all the monasteries yeah, down? Yeah, I mean, they wanted to destroy a lot of these things, so there may be no record of where they went. Well, I don't think we've got anything in there. This is an extraordinary find. Relics beneath the altar would have been displayed on feast days, drawing pilgrims to this chapel to make offerings. Frustratingly, the bones have long since been removed, so we can't date it. Jackie, I've got bone here. But in a different part of the chapel, Bridge thinks she's found another burial. And it's human. Part of the human foot bone. You've got look to it's have a, more oh, down there. Yeah, there is a lot down here. You can see it's ranging from here to about here. Yeah, so that looks like it's in situ. It's not moved anywhere. So where's the grave cut? Well, I think that these two large stones here, which end about here, mark one side of it. Mm -hmm. And what I've been thinking of as a wall here is actually marking the foot end of it. Which is interesting, given that we've got that over there. Yeah, it does look like that might be a, a head marker then. Yeah. The next one along. The next one over. Croft Andrew found a skeleton here, didn't he? He found two here, but they were a much higher level. Can you see in the section here, you can actually see where he took out this grave. And then it also seems that he, he took one from on top of this small wall here. This gets better and better. The small wall was Glastonbury's chancel, and this means that Bridges' burial could well be related to an earlier chapel. And now Oliver's convinced he's found it. Well, the evidence, we've got these two whacking great yeah, yeah. post holes in yeah. front of us, but the killer piece of evidence is the fact that they align really nicely with the rock cut feature stretching off into the distance there, and the fact that together they're on a different alignment to the walls right. that we can see, only by a couple of degrees, yeah. but I think it's significant. If Oliver's right, it means a wooden chapel was here before the Glastonbury monks arrived. And the exciting news is that if Bridges' burial is related to it, a bone sample could actually date it. And another thing, we can kiss goodbye to the theory that Glastonbury built the chapel from scratch to prevent pilgrims from losing their lives getting out to the island. It's all getting pretty exciting over there, apparently, so we're going to leave a skeleton crew on the headland, which is fairly appropriate, I suppose, and the rest of us are going over to see what's happening. After we left, it seems our archaeological hermits made the most of their island experience. They've even been barbecuing limpets in a bid for authenticity. No, they're very tasty. It is hard work. But this morning, they've been hard at it. The big news is that Matt's found a burial carved into the bedrock. Ian thinks he's finally found the west wall of the chapel. And Tracy's cleaned up the possible standing stone. So, ah, you've got a grave cut, haven't you? This is it here, look. You can see it cut into the shale going all the way along there. There's a wider head end coming back down here. Do my eyes deceive me, or is that a very big bone? That is a very big shin bone. There's his foot there. Um, unfortunately, no knee bone and no sign of a thigh yet. Do you think it might belong to the same person we found on the first day? Well, well in a way, I hope not, because that would mean the burial's been really disturbed. Disturbed or not, if he's buried inside the building, he could be a significant figure in the chapel's history. That's a really curious-looking wall you've got there. Well, yes, but I did tell you yesterday that this was a crucial part of the site. Now we've got it cleaned up, I think we can say that it's probably the buttress for the chancel arch, because you see that the wall carries on, and you see it's very, very nicely plastered. But I think what is interesting is that it's quite a complicated story, because here you've got this plaster here, and you can see the line of the wall continuing through here. So I think that this stone is actually added on, which implies to me that this is not just one chapel that was built and then that was it. Periodically, it was refurbished, it was strengthened, it was modified. It's a very, very long story. And part of that story, the addition of the chancel, is exactly the same as we found on the mainland. But this isn't the only similarity. It looks like Matt's burial is in the same position as the reliquary in front of the altar. 
If only our big boned man could tell us when he was buried. Because we're running out of time to work out just how long this story is. But with a few hours left, we're putting another trench in. Because Stuart spotted a ditch running all around the top of the hill, which might give us an idea of how long a chapel has stood here. We're only just below the surface and already we've got some finds. It's certainly medieval at the latest, um, mm. probably earlier. It is handmade. Just to uh, throw a spanner in the works. Yeah. Just, well, that's found not, a, just found a, a Roman radius. <laughs> That may influence my decision about the pot. <laughs> <laughs> this could actually be a Romano British shirt then. So perhaps the origins of the island chapel go all the way back to Roman times, if not further. This is such a typical time team trench. On day one, when Ian started digging, he came down on this mysterious stone structure. Can you see how it's kind of slanted here? And they all thought, hmm, this could be a Bronze Age beehive cairn, maybe with a burial inside it. Very exciting, very, very old. But then, as they came further down, they realised that this was something that had been cut away, that this was actually part of the chapel, and who knows what was here. Maybe it was a supporting column, maybe it was a little tower, and it wasn't until today when Ian finally discovered this mysterious semicircle of stones with this strange staining on it that he realized what it was it's actually a Victorian flagpole and he's got a find to prove it it makes you wonder what else Ian can turn up before the end of the day meanwhile there are some exciting developments over the water we've removed the chancel wall to reveal the grave bridge found this morning and discovered it's potentially the earliest thing we found on the mainland. The edge of the grave appears to be running along here. And as you can see, it's in a completely different alignment to this wall. So it's obviously going to be much earlier than this, but how, how much earlier is difficult to tell. But what is interesting is that, you see, I saw these slates here. Now tracking them back to establish whether it is actually a floor. And it looks like in this section, starting to get a masonry, perhaps with a wall, and that's more on the right alignment to be associated with the alignment of these burials. But the other nice thing about that bit of flooring is it's at the same level that that reliquary box is. It looks like we're heading further back into the time of the Cornish saints, because the latest theory is that our burial and reliquary are from an even earlier chapel than the one Oliver found, which Glastonbury probably revamped by adding a chancel. And if so, pilgrims could have been coming to pay their respects to relics in this box long before Glastonbury's time. Meanwhile, the island has turned into a hive of activity. Kerry is trying to lift the possible standing stone without much success. And it's all going on in the oval enclosure where we've been pulling out a coin every eight minutes. So far, there are six. Jonathan, that means one more coin and you've got another hoard to your name. You've got one beautiful coin here that you can clearly see the figurine of a goddess on the back. Back on the lawns, the huge stone doesn't want to stand up, so Kerry's now burrowing under it. It's smooth underneath, so see, I don't think there's anything under there. I think we can go for the standing stone. Exciting as this is, it's undateable. But it's better news in the oval enclosure where we've got our seventh coin. This is now legally and officially a hoard. Pretty good trench, Mick. It is. I think it's very interesting that the, the top layer's got this Roman stuff in it because it suggests perhaps that that's the end of the life of the ditch and it's actually a lot earlier than that. What, prehistoric? Well, it could be. I mean, it's an oval, of course, which is the sort of shape you'd get in prehistory. And I wonder if it's not a prehistoric ditch around a prehistoric settlement somewhere on this hilltop. With our little chapel plonked in the middle later on. That's the intriguing thing. They've then used the enclosure. They've probably a slight ditch and bank and they've used that as the enclosure around the church. That's fantastic. Fantastic. All this is more evidence that the chapel had early origins, and Phil's beginning to get an idea of just what an enormous undertaking it was to construct a chapel on top of the island. So I can't get over 
digging down in here is just how much they've used the natural geology to really make the chapel stand out. Look, you've got solid bedrock over there. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm down over a metre down here, no bedrock. I think the, the ground must plummet away. This wall is right on the edge of the natural. So it'd been right on the top of the hill. They could have seen the whole coastline and be seen as well, I guess. That's right. But of course, because they've, they've sighted it here, they've had to make massive foundations mm. and they even splay out here to take the main thrust of the chancel. It's fascinating. It's a hell of a piece of engineering, I'll tell you. It must have been an awe-inspiring sight for pilgrims making the trip out to the chapel across the water the last three days have demonstrated just how unpredictable the seas can be, because the tides are turning again. But just before we go, Matt's found something very unusual, some dating evidence from within the grave. These are medieval shirts of Polk. One's actually got a little spot of glazing, so that helps me a little bit. I think these are mid to late 13th century. So how does that fit into the, uh, the history of the island and this chapel, Nicholas? Well, the late 13th century is when Glastonbury is giving up this site and bringing the monks back. But it's possible that this is one of the last monks or priors of the place. And if it's not that, it's the Lord or Lady of the Manor. It's clearly a very important grave. It's being excavated out of the rock. It's at a pole position in the church. And Matt's burial isn't alone. Just as we're packing up, outside the west end of the chapel, Ian's found what looks like a kissed burial. But you're going to be staying here anyway, aren't you? So will you let us know at some time what it was? Sure. Cheers. Matt, we've got to go, like, now. OK, let's go. Even as we're loading onto the boat, another kissed burial emerges from under the south wall. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Tony. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. It's beginning to look like this enclosure could have been a burial ground for thousands of years, maybe even into prehistory. Over the last few days, we've discovered that the story of our two chapels began long before Glastonbury's monks arrived, when Lou Island could well have been one of the earliest outposts of Christianity. And a chapel on the top would have been a beacon of hope for traders from the Mediterranean crossing formidable seas. Sometime later, another chapel was built on the mainland, at the same height looking to the island, with our reliquary box at the altar for pilgrims to visit. And eventually, in the 12th century, Glastonbury's monks rebuilt both the chapels as a sort of St Michael theme park. Over the last three days, we've just scratched the surface of this magical island, which has been a very special place going way back long before Christianity.